author of groundbreaking works, international bestsellers including The War on the West, The Strange Death of Europe and The Madness of Crowds, Douglas Murray. We're so glad to have you. I think you're in Oslo somewhere. We weren't sure if we were going to get you tonight. Uh, but let's start with the conflict in Gaza. And there are many calls in the moment, particularly in the West, for Israel to have a proportionate response to the attacks against it by Hamas. Uh, Douglas, is that something that Israel should take into consideration? No, I've always thought that the whole idea of proportionality and conflict is absurd. Um, it's something which I think Western countries and the UN, who always gang up on Israel whenever Israel is, is attacked, it, it's something that these people always obsess about only in the case of Israel. Um, we in Western democracies, whenever we've had to wage war in the past, do not say, is this entirely proportionate in a response? Because proportionate is an abstract idea. What is proportionate in a conflict? Mm. Proportionate in this conflict would mean that uh, the response to the massacre of more than a thousand Israelis in cold blood by Hamas a couple of weeks ago uh, should be responded to by Israel by sending Israeli forces to rape exactly the same number of women as Hamas raped and to decapitate exactly the mm. same number of babies as Hamas decapitated and to steal hundreds of Palestinians and hold them in dungeons and torture them as Hamas did. I mean, the, it's obscene to even think in these terms. And yet that's what proportionality would mean in this conflict. When people say proportionate, they, we, that the Israeli response must be proportionate, there are several things they're doing. One is that they are showing that they are utter ignoramuses because they know nothing about Israel's war since 1948 when its neighbors have repeatedly attempted to annihilate it. And they don't seem to realize that as has very often been said, not least, I think, by Golda Meir. You know, if if if, if uh, Hamas laid down its arms, if the Palestinian extremists, jihadists, laid down their arms, there'd be peace. Whereas if Israel laid down its arms, there'd be no Jewish state. So when people say proportionate, proportionality about Israel, what they want is they, they want to signal, well, you do sort of have the right maybe to respond to the massacre, abduction, and rape of your citizenry, maybe if you're Israel, but do reply with one hand tied behind your back, won't you? And don't win. That's what they're also saying. Whatever you do, don't win. <laughs> don't bring this, any of these wretched conflicts to a conclusion. Make sure you draw so that you end up stopping roughly at the point just before the conflict began. Well, in the aftermath of Hamas's attacks and Israel's counteroffensive, we are hearing a lot of talk, particularly from academia, about decolonization. Uh, what we saw Hamas on, unleash against Israel was decolonization in action. Douglas, will there now be any awakening or acknowledgement from academia and, and the wider left about the anti-West sentiment, this decolonization narrative that they have been pushing? I, I wish there would be, Rita. I really wish there would be. But I mean, let me just give you a couple of examples of what academics in uh, America have said. We had an academic in America uh, who, since the massacre of Jews a couple of weeks ago, um, announced that that only six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust, as if that was a sort of not a high enough number for him. Mm. Uh, he uh, he he was at which which university he was at? Oh, he was at Stanford. He was at Stanford. Here's oh. here's a reprehensible a reprehensible uh, woman called Mika Tosca, who who teaches at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, this week she uh, described uh, Israelis Jews as pigs savages and irredeemable excrement and she describes herself by the way rita as a radically optimistic transsexual climate scientist well good luck to her with her optimism because if she was in the gaza being her transsexual climate optimist self i reckon she'd last about 24 hours at the hands of of, of hamas and co but these people who are describing jews as excrement and much more are doing so in the same week that that, that a, a synagogue was firebombed in Berlin, 
as Jews in Berlin are waking up to find symbols outside their house to signal it's the house of a Jew. I mean, mm. I know that there's only one historical lesson that our era seems to know anything about, and that's the 1930s and 1940s. But if anything could show you that people can do replays of that whilst thinking they're doing so in in some different light, as if they are anti-fascist, mm. and yet they all this language of fascism, of of demeaning the Jews, of of excommunicating the Jews, of othering the Jews. They they, they want to find mm. every crime of our era, including decolonization, and accuse the Jews of it. And it's been like that throughout the history of anti-Semitism. As uh, I finish on this thought, if I may, but as Vasily Grossman says in his masterpiece, Life and Fate, uh, show me what the Jews what, show me what you accuse the Jews of, and I'll show you what you're guilty of. All of these people making these wow. disgusting claims, it's them that's guilty of the thing. Absolutely. And I've, I've even, I don't get shocked easily, but in the past week, I have been shocked by just how callous and cruel people can be in the way they're dehumanising uh, a whole race of people. Uh, yes. Now, to move on to, uh, to to move on to a different issue, uh, you made headlines again this week because uh, you introduced Kevin Spacey, uh, who performed a Shakespearean monologue at Oxford. Tell me about the actor who went from being really one of the most critically acclaimed Hollywood actors of his time to being cancelled is he back now should he be back well he was uh, cancelled because there were uh, false accusations leveled against him uh, which were proved to be uh, untrue in the american courts and then in the british courts uh, this summer and um he's an extraordinary actor an extraordinary talent uh, he revived the uh, old Vic Theatre in London twenty something years ago. Uh, he was, of course, dropped by Hollywood and all of these all of these brave actor types and producers in Hollywood who always pat themselves on the back with their bravery. But they they ditched him <laughs> straight away and didn't bother to wait to see whether he was found guilty or not. And of course, he was found not guilty. And I think it's just a horrible travesty. It was a horrible travesty, and a, a horrible tale of our era and our unforgiving just nasty era and um i was giving the first of this year's roger scruton memorial lectures at oxford of course roger in the last year of his life suffered an attempted cancellation and um mm. i said uh, to kevin spacey uh, that, uh, some while ago that the next time i had a stage i'd i'd ask him to honor me with by sharing it and uh, what uh, we decided to do what i decided to do on monday was that I ended up finishing this lecture about cancel culture, about the horrible um, uh, judgments that our age makes and sticks to, even when the evidence is against it. I talked about Shakespeare's great play, Time and of Athens, where something very similar occurs, and then invited Kevin Spacey to the stage to read the scene. Nobody in the um, audience or theatre knew what I was going to do. Uh, only one other person was in on it. And um, so when I introduced Kevin Spacey to make his first return to the stage in seven years or so, wow. uh, the audience in the room was pretty gobsmacked. Uh, it, it, Spacey performed, of course, the most amazing performance. I urge people to go and watch it on, on YouTube. Uh, it was uh, heart-stopping and, and absolutely tear-jerking for everyone in the audience. He acted as brilliantly as anyone could act. And when he finished, the audience got to their feet as one in a standing ovation. Wow. It was a wonderful thing to see. I hope that he is back. He deserves it. Our society cannot keep destroying talent and throwing it away. We just can't. Well, I've got another example of cancel culture, and this one is as Orwellian as it gets. They're trying to cancel George Orwell. Uh, the Telegraph reports that George Orwell was sadistic, misogynistic, homophobic, and sometimes violent. This is according to a biographer of the legendary writer's wife who claims the darkness that runs through 1984 is a reflection of his soul. So based on that, we've got these headlines, Douglas. That seems fair. I mean, it's extraordinary. Just take one of those accusations, by the way, homophobia. Uh, first of all, George Orwell wouldn't have known what you're talking <laughs> about uh, uh, when you say ho homophobia. 
Um, uh, did George, I mean, first of all, none of this stuff is like at all unknown. George Orwell in Human Being, a shocker. Um, secondly, this, so this is just an attempt to grab headlines by the, by the author in question. The second thing is, um, yeah, George Orwell, for instance, didn't have the views we have in 2023 about gays, uh, particularly about gay men. Um, that's not surprising because uh, he was brought up in the early 20th century when most people uh, didn't uh, have uh, positive views about things like gay marriage. Um, quite a lot of men in particular were a bit suspicious of gay men. That was sort of normal at the time. George Orwell gave us some of the most important uh, uh, works of the 20th century, some of the most important journalism, and of course, some of the most important fiction. I can say this perhaps as a gay man, maybe I have some privilege to say this, I don't give a damn that George <laughs> Orwell didn't think that gay people were exactly quite the same as say himself or had some suspicions about them and and much more i don't give a damn i don't need him mm. to be in total alignment with my views in 2023 it's so damn superior who do these people think they are to judge orwell judge yourself <laughs> Now, before you go, we've seen some um, truly disturbing scenes uh, across Europe, New York, London, where Palestinian supporters are tearing down posters of missing Israelis, people taken hostage by Hamas, often women and children. In London, the police are even warning the members of the campaign against anti-Semitism that they should turn off their billboards on, the, on their trucks featuring the images of the missing Israelis. Uh, what is happening in, in London in particular, Douglas? Who are the police protecting here? Oh, they're protecting the terrorists and the terrorist supporters. Uh, the Home Secretary has spoken a good game about arresting people who are promoting terrorism, but we really have yet to see that happen. Um, uh, maybe it's a numbers game. Maybe they've worked out that there are more Muslims in the UK who are likely to be sympathetic to Hamas than there are Jews who are likely to be sympathetic to Israelis. Uh, maybe they've thought that, but you know, the thing that's disturbed me most about this and the thing that I think the wider population should think about is when one black man was detained and then uh, killed uh, by one cop in Minnesota a few years ago, thousands of people came out across the globe, in capitals across the globe. And, you know, if anyone had, mm. had appeared outside an American embassy during that period after George Floyd was killed and joked about the, the killing of George Floyd or, or laughed at it or praised it, had organizations praising it and saying, this is a great victory for the Minnesotan police. I reckon they'd have been arrested because most people don't like um, taunting victims. Now imagine if 1,300 George Floyds had been killed in that way and deliberately sought out by people to be killed. You know, there would be an awful lot of solidarity. And I have a big question after the last week in particular, uh, which is, Firstly, where's the reciprocity? And one, one Jewish demonstrator in London who saw these posters of kidnapped children being torn down said this, said, we were with you with BLM. Why aren't you with us now? Well, I'm sorry, that's a fast mm. learning curve. And, so, and, and so the other part of that question is a very deep one, which is where are the crowds? Where are the non-Jews? All those people who turn out for racial injustice, who turn out for microaggressions, who turn out in support of non-existent trans genocide, where are they when there's actually attempted mm. genocide of Jewish people? Why are the Jews demonstrating alone? Why are the rest of the populations of countries like Britain and Australia and others not standing by them by the millions? We should be, we ought to be. It's to our shame that we're not.